too long. Good evening to all of you. I see many young people, and I'm happy about that because uh, AI is going to be part of your lives more than some of us. Uh, so glad you could come. I'm glad to see a lot of young people. Okay, um, we're going to divide this evening into obviously two parts. I'm going to tell you a little bit about AI. And then we'll open it a little bit to make sure there's some interaction. Um, so allow me just a little bit at the beginning to walk you through, through some concepts. And then uh, we'll open it up for questions and I'm happy to take any questions if I can I'll answer. I'm going to just give you a little bit of background about me so you know how I'm related to this. Um, I wasn't good enough to go to engineering school, so they sent me to study this new subject that nobody wanted to study called computer science. <laughs> and I met my wife Susu, who's here at school, and her department, which was the best department in the engineering school, electrical engineering, always made fun of us on the second floor we were studying computer science. We were the kids who couldn't make it to her floor. But that tells you how this all started. So uh, it all started for me when I came to the US. I came to Los Angeles in 1980. I was 18. And I lived in the basement of St. Mary's Church. And Abun Antonios told me, what do you want to study, son? Uh, I said, I want to study mechanical engineering like you. He was a mechanical engineer. And he told me, that's wonderful, but your English is off. So why don't you go and study some of this new thing called computer science? Because you can just sit behind the computer and nobody will see you. And that's why I picked computer science, because I didn't speak English well. And Abun Antonio told me this is good for those who don't speak English well. And that's how my journey started. But of course, in 1980, the computer field was just beginning. And I was lucky because I ended up becoming a student of the man who invented the word artificial intelligence. His name is John McCarthy, and he was my professor, my mentor. So I ended up studying artificial intelligence in the mid 80s. And at the end of my studies at Stanford, my professor who invented artificial intelligence told me, my son, if you want to put bread on the table, skip artificial intelligence and go do something else. And I did. I did. So I left all my training in AI and I went to do something new at the time called the internet. He says, why don't you do this new thing called networking? Maybe you'll make more money and put bread on the table. And it was a good advice. So I ended up focusing on the internet and catching the wave of the internet as it started. Because you know, the internet became public in 1994. Before that, it was still in the labs. And so in 94, when it became public, I was at the beginning of this and I built several internet companies, which I have now sold to IBM and Oracle and different companies, but I'm no longer doing that. So a little bit, let's start with this background by telling you what happened to me last week. Last week I was in Boston and I was interviewing in, a, in my company the man who invented the internet. The man, for those of you who are technical, the internet has a protocol called TCP IP. He's the one who invented TCP IP. Without it, there's no internet. His name is Vint Surf, and Vint and I are friends, so he came to my company and I interviewed him in front of a lot of people. And the first question I asked Vint was, Vint, you invented the internet. By the way, he did it here at UCLA. This is where he, he was a Van Nuys High School student, and he and his three friends at Van Nuys High School invented it. 
Bob Kahn, Ben Cerf, and Steve Kroc. These are the inventors of the internet. And they did it mostly at UCLA. They used to, to carry each other on each other's backs and jump through the windows of UCLA, the high windows, during the weekend and sneak into the computer labs to invent the internet. And they did. It's a great story. If you ever see Ben on TV, or he was just on CBS this morning, uh, hear his story because it's quite fascinating. But I asked him, what do you think about AI? What do you think will happen? And what was Ben's answer? I don't know. I don't know. And this is the man who is currently the chief internet technologist of Google worldwide. And he invented the internet. So he is in the game. And he still told me, I don't know. So it is with this humility that all of us this evening should listen and learn about AI. And I will be first to tell you, I don't know. Now, for some of you, this may be scary. <laughs> you know, if Vin doesn't know, and Fadi doesn't know, and many of us don't know, where are we going? What is going on? But I'll tell you why. After, I'll ask you this after I'm done. Meaning, let's just be open minded. Let's not be. Let's start by believing that this is a creation of man and God will bless it too. Because He will bless all creation, including AI. Now, that means we have responsibilities and I'll get to that. But let's start by believing it as opposed to being fearful. Now, let me. Let's take a show of hands, and I have a feeling the youth will prevail here. But who has used AI? Right, you see the young people all raise their hands, a few people here, okay? Uh, well, let me tell you, those of you who did not raise your hands, you actually all used AI. You just don't know it. Because just about everything you do today on your little phone is AI driven. Just about everything you do. Okay, so Google search is AI driven. If you do maps, it's AI driven. If you if you speak, if you if you go visit a few websites, there is all kinds of AI going on in the background. Um, so AI is everywhere. It's just been kind of it was like salt, and you don't feel it. It's not like you're going to go to a website that says this is AI. Everything will have AI. Every part of our lives will be affected by this new technology. Okay? Should I show you a little bit of AI before we start? For those of you who didn't raise your hands, okay, but I'm going to go to a program. All of you have heard of the program ChatGPT. All of you heard about this program? Okay, so this is ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a transformer. That's what the T is for. And this is a new technology that allows machines to transform massive numbers of tokens, they call them. And through these tokens and the access to data, they can do that new information that was not programmed by a human. This is very important understand that. So what you're about to see was not done by a human. So I'll show you something. This happened to me today. I don't know if you heard on the news, but there was a, a, a report that comes out every year called the World Happiness Report. They study every country in the world and they see which is the happiest country based on a lot of things they study. So I downloaded the report. Here it is. Oh, and for those of you uh, who can't see, it's 158 pages. I don't know about you, but I don't have time to read 158 pages. Why do I want to look at the report? Why would we want to look at the report? Because our first question is, hey, uh, where's Egypt in that report? <laughs> yeah. So I grabbed the report, and I dragged it, which I'm about to do now, and I put it here, you see? And I told ChatGPT, Excuse me, just a minute, I'll put my paper down. I said, how did Egypt do in this report? 
Question mark. Hold on. Am I on the net? Yes, I am on the net. I just want to make sure I'm on the internet. If you have not, you can call Vince, sir. Yeah, I can call Vince, sir. Just move. <laughs> Let me try it again. I'm going to drag it, drop it, say, how did Egypt uh, rank in this report? Question mark. Let's give it a minute. It may be. Is the internet working here? Yes. It should be. It's not strong. It needs more muscles. Okay. So, uh, whilst I see, oh, here it is. Okay, it was reading the report. So, I just uploaded 157 pages. It's reading the document. And in a few seconds, it will have read the whole document and start telling me how Egypt did. Okay. It never saw that document before. Egypt ranked 127. I can then ask any questions because unlike search, ChatGPT remembers what you just asked. So you can keep having a conversation. You don't need to stop now. Um, did Egypt do better than Libya? Whatever you want, you can ask. You don't need to give context again. It now understands. Yes, Egypt did better than Libya. Egypt was 127. Libya was 66 and the life evaluation score of 5.36. It tried the whole report and it's now summarized. Let's try something different. Give me a summary of Pope Shenouda. What it's telling you has never been written by a human. You need to remember that. It is reading everything on the internet, every book ever published, and it's summarizing it in its own language. That's what's happening. I'm going to stop that and now ask something a teeny bit scary. Can you write a new letter in the style of the Apostle Paul addressed to the people of Egypt and focused on current Affairs. Okay. You can ask it to write in the style of Socrates. You can write it, you can ask it to write in any style. It's pretty amazing stuff. Okay? This is all happening in real time. All right, let me stop this. I'm going to show you something new that just came out. I hope I kept it here. Is this Herbert 4? Yeah, this is ChatGPT 4. Now, this is brand new. This just came out. Oops, sorry. Oh, I, I apologize. This, the, the young people are going to love this. It's actually quite amazing. This just comes from the same company that does um, ChatGPT. And instead of you dealing with words, you now can tell this machine any sentence. So this is the sentence. A stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filled with warm, glowing neon city signage behind her. She wears a black leather jacket, a long red dress, and black boots. 
you told the machine something from your head, and the machine built a video in real time. This video did not exist before. It was just made by AI. For those of you planning to work in the movie industry, you should be thinking about what this means. Because this would have taken a typical graphic designer or videographer a good week to produce, not to mention having to go to Tokyo and take, you know, a team and a staff. And this was all done by a machine. And look at the quality of what's being produced here. Okay? And you can build, you remember Pixar? And all the work they have to do to build cartoons? The prompt here is send me several giant woolly mammoths approaching, treading through a snowy meadow. Their long woolly fur lightly blows in the wind. The machine comes back in two seconds with this. Okay, so just a few touch-ups so you get a sense of what AI is able to do. Now, what I'm going to spend a little time with you on is the following. And we can put the lights back, back on so we all stay together. I, I don't love slides, but I just put the agenda so you can follow what I'm going to cover. So I'll start by covering a little bit what is AI. So if you're asked, you have a sense of what it is. Then we'll talk a little bit about its history, how it came about very quickly. Again, I'm going to do these really, each of these is a five hour lecture, but I'm going to spend five, 10 minutes on each so we can have time for questions. We'll talk a little bit about the good that AI will bring, and we'll talk about the not so good that AI will bring. And then we're going to talk about my area of specialty, which is called AI guardrails. In other words, how do we make AI safe? What do we need to do? What laws, what policies, what programming, what things we need to do to make AI safe? And then finally, I'll touch a little bit on AI and our faith because there are good things and bad things going in that space and our kids and our, those of us who are parents, who are servants, we have a very important responsibility to be aware of what's coming and how our kids will be affected. Okay? So let me start a little bit with what is AI. So AI is a man-made machine. It's Let's start with that. It's a man-made machine. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, the machine is sentient and it has consciousness. It's a man-made machine. Okay, let's start with that. What does it do? Okay, I want to show you just the progression because this I studied, frankly, uh, when I really started working in 1984 at a place called Bell Labs, where the transistor and the laser were invented. It's a big number now. There's, and my, my boss taught me this, and I never forgot. He didn't teach me, teach me this part, but I'll tell you what. He taught me that in the 1960s and to the 1980s, the United States and the United Kingdom were leaders in really figuring out that data is a very, very important asset that we should manage. And for those of you who don't know, IBM was one of the very first companies that was very focused on data. But IBM, when it started, a little bit of history, was the company made machines for me to grind in. IBM stands for International Business. Business machines, those business machines were meat grinders. That's where IBM started. But then the government came to IBM and said, you can build big machines. We need you to build a machine for data, to manage data. And the data revolution started. People started realizing data has value. And if we have machines that could make data, that's a good thing. So that was the 1960s through the 80s. The big companies in that era were IBM, Hewlett Packard, you know, all these big players, you know, some you don't know anymore, like Data General and so on, they 
disappeared, but these were the big players. Then we moved from the age of to the age of information. What is information? It's organized data. It's data that is put together in ontologies and taxonomies, so it's structured. Okay, and it's delivered to you so that it's immediately valuable. For example, GPS data, when data about every map in the world is put together and delivered to you as a GPS product on your phone, so you can go from A to B, that's information. And so who were the big companies in the information age in the 1990s and in the 2010s? So those 20 years. Microsoft, right? Uh, and then Google, and then Meta. Now, all these were the big companies of the last information age. But that age, to a large degree, shifted now in the 2020s to the age of knowledge. What is the difference between knowledge and information? Data, organized structure, becomes information. Information equipped with the ability to make reasoning and deductions rapidly becomes knowledge. And when the machine is able to do that, that's artificial intelligence. But when the machine is now able to take a lot of information and say, ah, and I could have asked how, when I asked it, write a new letter addressed to the people of Egypt, which obviously doesn't exist. Well, they try to that to the people of Egypt. In the style of Paul, what did it do? And I told them also to write it based on current affairs. So if you notice this, we're talking about the national the economic problems going on in Egypt now. So it read what? It read all the letters of Paul. It figured out Paul's stuff. Then it shifted to the fact that I knew the current of Egypt. So it read everything of Egypt now in real time. It combined the two and it generated a new piece of knowledge that I asked it to create. That's what AI does. Professor uh, Mr. Powell, who was my boss at Bell Labs in 1984, told me this, but he didn't tell me this. And this is what we should be thinking about as Christians. Because there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. There's a huge difference. And sometimes the enthusiasts about AI confuse knowledge with wisdom. Discerning between these two is important. In a discerning, a tamiz, in an amaze, in a knowledge with wisdom. Because wisdom comes from a different place. It comes from a place we know. Right? So that's the history. Now, when we talk about AI, AI does problem solving. It's amazing. Uh, by the way, for those of you, I'm sure the young people know that. How many neurons are between our ears? All of us. How many neurons we have here? Any doctors? Each of us has a hundred billion neurons between our heads. That's how each of us, this is how God created us. Amazing power. Here with this power. So, first of all, don't be fearful. We should, they still have a long way to catch up with us. A hundred billion neurons. We still don't know how they work. It's amazing. Because it's not biology, there's a lot more going on. Machines, though, are able to problem solve the computational things faster than us. Because when, unfortunately, they call this thing artificial intelligence, and they mix intelligence with many different components. There's emotional intelligence. There's computational intelligence. There are many types of intelligence. The computer is very good at computational intelligence. We cannot compete with the computer's computation. It's impossible. Did you see how fast it read everything? I mean, I could ask it almost anything that is in any book or on any internet page, and
and it can synthesize it and give me a digest before I blink. None of us could do that. But that's only one part of intelligence. Right? It's important to remember that. Now, the other thing it does very well, and it's starting to do more and more, is decision making. So, for example, yesterday, my, my, my niece is, a, my wife's niece is a radiologist in New York, and yesterday, the United Kingdom's National Institute of Health, kind of the equivalent of NIH, announced that for the first time, AI is detecting cancer far better than the humans. It's the first time. Five years ago, they said it's a little less. Two, three years ago, they said it's about the same as a human doctor. And now, it's detecting 20% more cancer cells than any group of doctors who are looking in the same picture. That's how good it will become. How does it do that? Through tremendous amount of computational uh, repetition of looking at the same things. And I know we're <coughs> pathologists in the room, the same thing with pathology. The machines will be doing this a lot faster. And before you all get worried, especially young people who are planning to be pathologists or radiologists, the good news is we have such a huge shortage in the US of pathologists and radiologists that at least for the next 10, 15 years, this is good news because we don't have enough humans to do the job. We have many machines to help us. But problem solving, decision making, learning. Have you heard before AI became very famous to most of us in the last few years, the term that you used to hear is machine learning or deep learning. That's the predecessor to generative AI. Okay? And machine learning is when the machine learns from doing. It does something, and you tell, oh, look, that was a mistake. So next time it doesn't do it. Did you hear, did you see something wrong? It apologizes. It says, I apologize. I, I, I got it. I will never do this mistake again. Okay? So the machine learns from the human or from data. This is important. That aspect is very important. Now, just a few seconds. One of the inventors of AI is Jeff Hinton. Jeff Hinton is a British professor who worked for Google until eight, nine months ago. Jeff quit one day, left Google from San Francisco and went back to England. And when they asked him what happened, yeah, what happened? I mean, you're one of the fathers of AI. He says, it's learning so fast, I can't even understand anymore how fast it is learning. So the machines are so fast now that even Jeff, who invented most of generative AI, got afraid of it. And he said, and I can't talk while I work for Google, so I quit my job so that I can speak up. Which, by the way, we should commend him for this. I mean, this. This is a courageous scientist. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to also uh, scare you just one last time, and then we'll move to history. There is a new field called AGI, not AI. When you see that word, it stands for Artificial General Intelligence, AGI. AGI is defined as when AI can surpass human capacity. Okay? Now, this is not a dream. I'm aware of at least two, three hundred billion dollars being spent on AGI. And this is just in the US. China is spending even more on AGI. AGI is truly taking AI to the next level. And general means that the machine doesn't need to be trained by a lot of models and data. The machine can now create its own data, its own knowledge. Right? I won't get into that. This is a very complex subject, but it's now a frankly a geopolitical race between only two and two countries, the US and China. 
they're, they're fighting as fast as possible to get to the AGI capability. When will we get to AGI capability is probably what you all want to ask me. And the answer is I don't know. No one knows. Some people say it's five to 10 years. Some people say it's 20 to 30 years. But we're going to get there. There will be a machine that will surpass it. And of course, hopefully by then, we will have some answers on how to constrain a machine that is smarter than us. Right? Enough scared. We get back to some things. Why did my professor tell me to leave AI in the mid 80s? And why I now would recommend to any young person who is inclined to study and understand? Why? What's the change? Why did, at the time, my professor tell me, okay, get away from this field, you're not going to make any money? Because to achieve AI, you need three things. Remember those things. You need data, first of all. Data is the fuel of the AI machine. And in the 1980s, there was no internet. Today, there is this thing called the internet, and there is a lot of data. There's not just data because somebody uploaded every book on the planet. There's data because how many of you here are without a cell phone tonight? Nobody. So each of you is carrying in your pocket if a major data generating machine that is feeding data to the AI engines. Every time you move, every time you look for something, every time you buy something, every time you say something, this is all going to these engines. So data did not exist in the beginning. Data is abundant. That's the first ingredient for AI. The second ingredient for AI. Uh, is what we call in technical terms the algorithms, but you could chat GPT is an algorithm. There are many different kinds of algorithms. By the way, algorithm is an Arabic word. Right? So so is algebra. Most words that start with al are Arabic. Algorithm comes from algorithm. So anyway, but algorithms are essentially the thinking part of AI. But it doesn't think well without data. So data and algorithms. Now algorithms existed in my creation, not as sophisticated, but they existed. But data did, not in abundance. And the third and last thing you need for AI, how many of you here have been investing in a company called NVIDIA? A few people know what NVIDIA is. NVIDIA is the company that makes the fastest computer chip for AI in the world. And if you had invested in them two years ago, you probably would be very doing very well right now. But NVIDIA makes the chips that power computers to produce faster computation. Again, we didn't have that in the mid days. So what happened now is that these three things are available when you get together. We have the fastest computing power we've ever seen. I mean, it is not order, orders, thousands of orders of magnitude compared to the mid 80s. Machines are fast and cheap and abundant. Computational power. Data is abundant. And algorithms have improved immensely. The three things together create the revolution we're living in right now. That's why it's happening. A little bit of history, I won't spend time on that. The man who came up with the concept that the machine could think is a British guy called Turing. You may hear about the Turing Award, the most important award for people in my field. The Turing Award. Turing came up with the idea and he started thinking of it in the 1940s. You know who was Turing? Turing is the one who invented the machines that broke the German codes in World War II. You may have seen the movie. That's him. And he's the one who starts saying machines should start thinking. But he never figured it out. He, he wrote a lot about it. His most important paper about it, which was the seminal idea, he wrote in 1936, and that paper is lost. 
Nobody had, we can't find it. And he's the one who wrote the kernels of this. But the person who coined the term artificial intelligence was Professor John McCarthy, with a friend of his called Professor Minsky. They were at a university called Dartmouth. And in the summer of 1957, they held a summer seminar called Artificial Intelligence. So this started in, in the 30s, 40s, but started becoming an idea in the 50s. And it took it from 1957 until today to become part of our lives. It's amazing. It really is quite amazing. It took this long. Now, um, if, for those of you who love to read, there's a great book you should read by a professor, a Chinese American professor. She's a woman, and her name is Fen Fen Li. She was at Caltech and Stanford. And she, frankly, in my opinion, is the person who figured out how to make things like ChatGPT work. And her story is wonderful. She wrote a beautiful book. It's a quick read. You can read it in the weekend. Because it's personal about her story as an immigrant. Her parents had a long romance. They didn't speak English. She would be inventing AI and taking calls from her mother because somebody was upset that their pants were not well pressed. And she'd deal with that and then come back to invent artificial intelligence. An amazing lady, Fen Fen Li. Fen Fen Li is the first one who said, I need to give the machines structured data. And she spent years with hundreds of people loading up thousands of images into a machine and annotating these pictures so the machine could learn what is it looking at. And it is that project called ImageNet, which was the precursor to generative AI. I won't bore you with all the details. A lot of history, a lot of people worked very hard. Fenfen was one of them to really get to that point. And by the way, she's now leading the Stanford University Center on human-centered AI, because she's very worried too. So she said, we need to create a center that studies how does AI serve humanity, not harm humanity. A great lady, I have a lot of respect for her. Okay, enough about history. There's a lot more to tell you, but I'll, I'll just go to good AI. Some, some good uses of AI. Um, I think AI is going to change work in ways, frankly, we can't even imagine. I'll give you an example. I have a company today with 34 employees, 35 employees. And I manage a portfolio of investments. Any company equivalent to me, given the size of my portfolio, would have about an additional 25 to 30 young people that I pay Roughly two to three hundred thousand dollars a year to do research. How am I doing without these people? I have an AI engine. When I get up in the morning, if I'm looking to make an investment, I ask AI, hey, good morning. Could you please go check all the news in the world about this company? Can you do the full reputational analysis of all the people who founded it? Can you give me all the recent information that any of my team members read all their emails with permission, read all their calendars, read all their notes, and come back and give me the digest? All of this happens before I blink. I pour my coffee and come back after a full digest. That would have taken a team of people a couple of weeks to assemble, and by the time they're done, it's all news. So that's an example of how work will change. Now, if you're worried about your work, ask yourself this question. Does my intelligence? If it does, you should be worried. But if it doesn't, you're okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm joking. If your work involves a lot of computational analysis, a lot of collecting data, a lot of summarizing data, a lot of digesting data, a lot of it will be affected. I guarantee you it will be affected. No matter what the base of knowledge you have to analyze data, the machine will be faster than you. There's just no possibility that we can keep up with the computational ability of the machine. 
to collect a lot of information, to read it, summarize it, and give you a digest. Think how many people do this all day. Think how many government jobs will go away. Collecting information, filling forms, checking files, coming back and saying, and yes, you qualify. That's so easy for a machine to do. You are banking. Well, it depends. It depends how much of your job has decision making. For example, Tyler was telling me he's a pathologist. That even if the machine can do his work much faster than it, which it does, and it will. But still, most of us, if we are going to get a pathology report that is important to us or to a family member, we still want a human to take a look. Even if the machine did a great analysis, there is something that a doctor can do that a machine can do. For now, that's the case. And in fact, in the UK, that report said that the government insists that even if the machine comes up with a radiology result, a doctor has to deliver it to the patient. And it will be like this for a while because we still have a long way to trust the machines. We still have a long way to go. Another great area I think I'm excited about is education. I think education is going to be a huge area of change. Those of us who are a little grayer remember that we spent most of our time in schools where the teacher is just telling us what's in the book. Remember, well, it's kind of I say right now, right? I mean, why do I need to remember? I need to learn to analyze. I need to learn to deduce, not to remember. When we, when I was a kid, most of my time was, I was head of my class because I had a good memory. That's useless right now, having a good memory. What is more important, and by the way, Finland, Finland is the best education system in the world. Their kids always perform better than any kid all over the world. And you know what? They no longer have tests and exams in high school. They cancel all of them. The teacher tells the kids, you come to the class to solve the problem. I'm going to give you information. You all work together to solve the problem. So the focus is now on solving problems, on sharing knowledge, on understanding each other rather than remember the facts and solve this equation. So education will change, I think, in a huge way. I'm already seeing it. I was just in Chicago with a company that provides the most math training for students and teachers in K through 12. All of their curriculum in the last year was replaced by AI. Why? So I'm going to explain something to you that will be very important. AI is able to take things like classes and personalize them to each one of us. This is very important, meaning AI has so much computing power, it can study each of you and educate you based on who you are and what you know. So the education will become what we call hyper-personalized for each person based on your knowledge. And that we could never do. Remember. Uh, the first university, modern university, was created in the 1500s in Bologna, in Italy. And what was the idea? Before then, for people to gain knowledge, they had a tutor. My grandfather was a tutor to Emperor Haile Selassie. He used to go personally to teach in French, you know, every day. That was his job. That's how education worked before universities were created really and spread around the world. Universities was the idea, but then not. Let's bring all the kids together in one class and have one tutor. It's called the one-to-many model, as opposed to the one-to-one -one model. And that's how we educated the masses. Well, now we can educate even bigger masses one-to-one -one again, because the machine will know you. You don't need to work as fast as everybody in the class or as slow as everybody in the class. The machine will teach you. This one-to-one -one hyper personalization will be used also against us in advertising, right? So for those of you who know how Google functions, how it reads your emails, if you have a Gmail, how it reads your searches, and then targets you. 
Has it happened to you that you sometimes see an ad and you say, how did they know I'm looking to buy a new refrigerator? They know. I mean, there's even some gray area about how much your microphone on your phone knows and listens to. This is a gray area, I don't want to scare you, but it's, it's not sure yet. That actually, even if you're sitting with Abuna, and you're saying, Abuna, I'm having financial issues, is the machine listening? And the next thing you'll get is, you know, do you need financial advice? This is this is uh, this is what what happens today, but it happens without them knowing. Imagine when they know you. Now they know you are a doctor, and you're in that stage of your life. You just bought a car. They will know everything about you. The machine will target you differently. So that's coming to watch for that in your own life, and try to create some distance with the machines. Don't have the machines in everything you do. Look, uh, I'm going to shift a little bit to some areas I'm worried about. You all know companies like Tesla, for example, are using AI to drive a car. You know that, right? Do you know what was their biggest problem? The biggest problem was called moral reasoning. They were trying to teach the machine to make a decision when it's driving, if it is about to hit a kid crossing the street, or it will veer to the left and there's an old person on the sidewalk. They were trying to teach the machine, do I kill the kid or do I kill the old person? No, no, I'm not kidding. It's very important. This is now teaching the machine not just physics of how do I maneuver, it's more, whose life is more valuable? This is a big deal. And this is just an example because this happens, this will happen in medicine, this will happen in other fields. The triage that we do every day in emergency rooms. You know? Machines will need to do triage. They need to decide. It's fascinating. So this was this is an area that frankly worried me. Another area that worried me, because I was engaged, I was senior advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on this issue, Tony Guterres, and he was very worried about decisions that drones are making on whom to kill. So this is now cyber warfare. So the drone is flying over Baghdad, and the drone is loaded with knowledge about people against whoever owns the drone. And the drone will say, oh, this is Fetty. Let me kill him. He's on my list. Today, that drone has to check back with the US control command or the Iranian, whoever owns the drone. And they have to look, confirm, and say, kill him. Well, with AI, they're saying the AI can decide. Should we let the AI decide? That was exactly, I gathered the panel in the United Nations on this point. Should we let machines make warfare decisions? It's, it's, it's a fascinating new area of control that governments want to have. Of course, a drone killing one person, Basita. Sorry, I don't mean to be dismissed. But how about a missile that's about to fall on a school, killing a lot more people? Right? It gets really hairy. Who makes these decisions? And how much should we let machines deduce? Now, the argument some people in the military are making is the machine is much faster. If I see the target and I need to take care of it, I don't want to go back to some humans looking at it. I want to make a decision. Let the machine make the decision. That's the fight that is taking place. And finally, I'll tell you the thing that worries me even more than this. Because I think cyber warfare and all these things will find solutions, and I'll come to that in a minute because my next point is about the guardrails, right? So I'll talk a little bit about the guardrails. But before I leave the not so good, this is important, Abuna, because this actually relates to us here as a community. When I asked Vin Cerf, the inventor of the internet, what is he most worried about? 
He says what I'm about to tell you. He says he's most worried that the truth will be difficult to find. The truth will be difficult to find. This is the founder on this. This is not just about wrong information. You know, some stupid AI engine tells me that, uh, you know, I read everybody's backgrounds and people who wear green sweaters are usually criminal. Sorry, again. <laughs> okay, but because that kind of stuff will happen, right? Oh, I read everything, and I know anybody. The statistics show that people with a green sweater are usually bad people. I'm not, that's not the untruth I'm worried about. Of course, there is now a political season. Do you know that about nine out of ten pieces of information on the political season are machine generated? Nine out of ten. Because the machines can generate things much faster than humans. If I'm a political person and I want to tell everybody in Detroit that Trump is a terrible human being, well, great, I'm going to put the machines on, and now the machines know you, and they will say, I know that Fedi hates this issue, so I'm going to target him with this piece of information. This is happening now, by the way. But AI is speeding this in ways you can't imagine. Because AI no longer can just send you an ad. <laughs> AI can make a video. And you saw that there were videos on Pope Francis, there were videos on Trump, there were that were all fakes. I actually I didn't want to show it to you, but I went and asked Sora, can you create a video for me of Pope Shenouda playing chess with Pope John Paul II? It did. <laughs> yeah, it, it can do that. So, of course, and you look at it and you think, okay, it's true, they were playing chess, there's a video. And they never play chess, it was all made up by a machine. Right? So, truth is the biggest victim potentially of all of this. We are about to get flooded with data that is what we call in the business synthetic, machine made. And your ability to know what is synthetic from what is not synthetic is complex. Any who knows technology knows that there is now a technology called Web3 or blockchain that could allow us to track the provenance of data. But it's, it's complicated. It's not that simple. Because there's a lot of data that will be flooding us. The truth is going to be important. Do you guys know that since generative AI started, there are now at least according to the count of AI, about 95 new global cults that have been started with new sacred text, text entirely written by Gen AI. And people are following these cults. Right? So, misinformation, mistruth, people who are uh, the PETA, which is the, I can't remember what it stands for, it's the organization who, who, who care for the humane yeah. something for the humane treatment of animals? Their marketing director, this is true, <clears throat> decided, and I want to recreate the Bible, but make it animal friendly. And it did. And they published it to say, you see, they, they, they republished the Bible, they removed any mention of eating meat. They, 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 and the machine did it in seconds. It read the whole Bible, removed everything related, and made it friendly to pets. The people said, Are you nuts? <laughs> really? And they were defending themselves. So what? As a kid, about a truth issue is going to become the biggest victim. And here, our homes, our families, our communities, Churches become immensely important not to just say that's the truth, that's the truth, but to plant in our kids the understanding of how to know the truth and where to find the truth because it will get harder to find the truth. It will get harder to find the truth, especially if you're looking in the wrong places, which some kids will, some kids do today. They look for truth in their own 
Okay, guardrails. How do we protect from all of this? So guardrails, I use that word. Uh, some of you know that I was the head of the organization that governs the internet. So there's an organization that the US government had created and President Obama had asked me to run that organization for four years. And my job was to create the rules for how the internet functions not all the internet, but the, the infrastructure. So I'm very familiar with how to create global laws, rules, policies to govern technology. And I used to teach that subject at Harvard and at Oxford. So I know this is well. I'm spending most of my time now, other than my day job, everything else I have to do, I give my time to this issue. So I'm going to share with you two, three things to understand how important this is. First of all, it is very difficult to create ways to guard AI because AI is not a national resource. It's not an international resource either. An international resource means it's a resource controlled by nations. It is not controlled by nations. It's what we call in the business a transnational resource. It's a resource like air. It's almost like the air. Can, can the U.S. says the air above America is not polluted? The air above Canada is polluted. The back of the No, because the air is transnational. It flies over everywhere. Well, the internet and AI are also transnational. There are ways to stop applications like China. In China, you can't use Google. You can't read the New York Times. But the actual infrastructure of the internet is worldwide. It's impossible to stop from country to country. So the rules need to be transnational. Have you heard of any transnational institutions? No. So the world has created the most high-level institutions we've created are the UN. And that's it. When you go to the UN, it's countries, governments talking to each other. Who controls AI? Governments? No. It's not governments, it's companies, it's individuals, it's scientists. So this is the difficulty of creating guardrails, is that we don't have institutions that know how to manage things. And that's why we still have very little agreement on climate change, because it's very hard to get people to agree on this, because it's transnational. Second issue, the scientists that created AI are the best people who understand it, but they are rarely involved in guarding it. I'll tell you a bit of history. In 1957, Einstein called all his scientist friends and he told them, we have a problem. We invented nuclear physics. They're going to make bombs with it. We should figure out how to stop it. And in 1957, in the summer, in a small in Canada called Papouache, in Nova Scotia, Einstein and 22 other brilliant nuclear physics scientists came together and they designed the guardrails of physics. And those guardrails, which took them a summer to do, became what is later called the non proliferation treaties between all countries. So the scientists played an important role. I'm going to skip forward. 1978, all the DNA scientists said, uh oh, this DNA stuff can get out of hand. Genetics could be a big problem. They all got together in a small town in California called Asiloma. Young people, you should read about this. It's amazing how scientists came together and said, we need to put rules around DNA technology. And they did. And the rules they did in 1978 are now the NIH rules, the National Institute of Health. 1999, same thing happened to the internet, led by Vince Cerf himself, the inventor of the internet. All the people who did the rules were scientists, not business people, not governments, scientists. So this month, I will be publishing an article in Fortune magazine saying, let the AI scientists come together and set the rules for the government. And I'm working with many of them now to bring them together so that we can form what was done in 57, 78, 98, again, this coming year. But it, that's the path we're taking. Then I'm taking one last other path, I'll share it with you. How many doctors in the room? 
how, how, uh, uh, all of you were new were, uh, soon enough. You're working on it. Um, those of you who are doctors, you took an oath. Do you remember that oath? Right? The, the Socratic oath. To do no harm. We are introducing a Socratic oath for AI, and I'm doing it through a university in Italy. They will start it there and then we'll spread it worldwide. And that's, you can look it up, it's called the digital oath. And the digital oath is an oath we are inviting all computer scientists to do, to do no harm. So in addition to top-down government rules and guardrails, how about waking the consciousness of every computer scientist as they're designing a program to think, is this going to harm? So we're trying to, and I already talked to people at Columbia, University of Chicago, several universities around the world, they're going to introduce it to their computer science classes. So every computer science student takes a note. You may tell me, can I'm following, of course, if uh, an engineer works for Google and they tell him to do X, he'll do it. He needs his job. Fine, but let's wait at least in them, like Jeff Hinton did and said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. His conscious woke him up and he said, I need to speak. So I'll stop here on guardrails and finish with a bit about our faith. This is a delicate subject, and we have people in the room who are much younger, so I'm going to cut a lot of pieces because it's delicate. But I just say this. Machines are soon going to become, in many ways, able to think for themselves. And you know how much we discuss in San and Musayyar and Mukhayyar. Are we thinking for ourselves or not? Well, we know now that we're going to have machines making reasoning on their own. Man has never created anything that can reason. This is the first time. And not only reason, reason much faster than us. On computation. Although many people think that social reasoning will come. I don't believe it, by the way. Some people do. Some people do. Meaning that the machine will start having social sensibilities. But let's ignore that. What I'm trying to just bring to your attention is the concept that we now have a creation that thinks for itself and is able to make decisions. This will challenge, as the Israeli 